welcome and uh, glad to see everybody here. We have a few regulars that uh, I know we see every time and we certainly appreciate everybody coming out and joining us today. Uh, as one television show used to famously open with and now for something completely different. Uh, normally the talks that we do here at Lunch and Learn are, are discussing a battle or a campaign or some great political debate or issue. Uh, today we're going to go somewhere just a little bit different. Uh, we're going to go to a small island off the coast of Virginia called Shinkatig. Not Chinkatig, Shinkatig. Okay. <laughs> uh, it is an interesting place. Uh, we're going to hear some island history. We're going to hear some island lore. And, yeah. Uh, we're going to an island, so him and his friends are going to be there as well. Uh, but at any rate, sit back. Put your feet up, pour yourself a glass of rum, uh, because even though it's war, for the next few minutes, uh, we're going to be on island time. Okay? All right. So, does everybody know where Shinkatig is? Anybody know? More or less? Okay. Uh, it is a small island off the eastern shore of Virginia. I'll go ahead and we'll get a, some perspective here. Right here. Okay. Uh, here we have a modern satellite photo, and this is Shinkatig Island. To the west, we have the mainland. Okay, that's what they call the eastern shore of Virginia, is the mainland there. We also have the Shinkatig Bay. Uh, this is marsh area. To the east, Assateague Island. Assateague is a true barrier island. It is 27 miles long. It averages just about a mile wide, uh, and it is a wildlife refuge. Uh, littoral currents build up the hook down here. You've got Tom's Cove. Between Shinkatig and Assateague runs the Assateague Channel. Okay? And one of the most famous events in the world takes place across the Assateague Channel every year. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, to the south, we have the Shinkatig Inlet. To the north, more of the Shinkatig Bay, which runs up into the Delaware area. Uh, up the coast of Assateague, you wind up uh, in, in the Delaware Bay, and actually can, that's how you can get to uh, Philadelphia that way as well. So anyway, that's more or less, gives you an idea of where Shinkatig is. Uh, whatever you do or do not know about Shinkatig, it does have a couple of famous residents. This little lady right here, this is probably the most famous Shinkatig resident. That's Misty, of Misty of Shinkatig fame. Uh, probably the most famous tiger there is. Tigers that natives call themselves. Shinkatig's second most famous native, this guy right here. This is Surfer Dude. His death last year made the national news. Okay, So you get the picture. The most famous residents of Shinkatig are the ponies that actually live over on Assateague and every year swim the Assateague Channel onto Shinkatig uh, and then get auctioned off and all that kind of fun thing. Uh, if you know where to look, there are some other famous residents uh, of Shinkatig, primarily the wildlife. This is a red-winged blackbird. This is a uh, Delmarva fox squirrel, which just got off the endangered list. And there we've got a, a heron. Uh, they know we're here. Now he's brought his friends. <clears throat> Come on. There. Yeesh. Uh, so, yeah, these members of the animal kingdom uh, are pretty much the, the, the main draw to Shinkatig now, uh, but that has not always been the case. And when the American Civil War began, Shinkatig Island and other barrier islands off the coast of Virginia, and Maryland as well, found themselves in a bit of a difficult position. Uh, the land grant for Shinkatig was created in 1650. It covered 1,500 acres of the island. Uh, landowner on the island was a fellow named Daniel Jennifer. By 1672, there are four farms on Shinkatig. They are owned by four families, Bishop, Bowden, Tar, and Jester. The Tars and the Jesters are still very prominent families on the island. In fact, the outgoing mayor was a Tar. So these are families that, that, that started on this island in the 17th century and are still there. And like any small island, Shinkatig has its share of lore. 
Uh, this is the Killick Shoals Lighthouse. It was built in 1886, obviously after the war, uh, but for many years it guided watermen and ferry boats around the dangerous Killick Shoal that exists between the mainland and Chincoteague. Eventually, it became known as the site of the best bathtub gin parties in the area. Everybody knew that open house events at the light were not to be missed. Uh, and like any island, even one in the mid-Atlantic region, it might have seen its share of smuggled things. Uh, today, on the northern end of the island, there is an area known as Smuggler's Cove. And that name, the origin of that name, might be just exactly what you're thinking. <laughs> At any rate, uh, these farms were set up, and initially farming was a major source of income on Chincoteague. The primary crops were corn, wheat, rye, apples, and pears. The problem with this was growth. In 1800, there were 30 families on this island. By 1835, there were 70, and by 1860, there were 150. By this point, no one family owns enough land to actually make any kind of a living at farming. Now, the inhabitants of Chincoteague had always supplemented their crops with seafood, which was everywhere. Uh, and as the amount of land available for each family to farm diminished, tigers began looking to the sea for their income. And this actually happens very fast. By 1833, the lion's share of income for the island began to be the harvesting and selling of a variety of seafoods. In particular, Chincoteague oysters uh, are going to start being considered quite a delicacy. They had a natural saltiness that made them unique and quite tasty. This is still true. You will find restaurants over on the island today that have disclaimers on their menu saying that we do not add salt to our oysters. Okay. Uh, they feel that they need to tell folks that. Uh, but the watermen, as all who make their living from the sea are called on the eastern shore, would harvest the oysters, shuck them, package them, and ship them north. It would seem primarily to Philadelphia and New York. Uh, Philadelphia in particular becomes very important to the Tigers. Uh, while Chincoteague oysters were popular in many northern cities, like I say, Philadelphia, New York, seemed to be the prime buyers. So as more and more oysters were sold to the north, the Tigers came to rely on those sales uh, for their livelihood. Bet you can see where this is going. <laughs> on April the 17th, 1861, the Commonwealth of Virginia voted to secede from the Union. Now this was not received happily on this tiny Virginia island. Uh, by the way, it was not received happily on another tiny Virginia island in the middle of the Ch uh, Chesapeake Bay called Tangier. Uh, there was hope that seafood sales might continue to the north, but when it became apparent that war conditions would not permit this, those islanders decided they had a decision to make. On May the 23rd, 1861, 140 island residents, all men, sorry ladies, you're not included yet, uh, but all men met to decide on a course of action. Now, while the Confederacy had its support, the Unionist feelings were pretty much overwhelming, and they were led by this fellow here, uh, John Wheelton. Uh, he and the Unionists pretty much carried the day, and on a vote of 134 to 2, Chincoteague men decided to ignore Virginia's declaration, secession declaration, and remain with the Union. Interestingly enough, those numbers are a bit iffy. Uh, the records of the vote have been lost, and post-war reports do vary. Uh, but most reports agree that this was a very lopsided vote. In fact, John Wilton himself would report after the war that only one secessionist vote was cast. Uh, Tangier Island also took its own vote, and this island as well decided to ignore uh, the secession uh, declaration. John Wilton here may be the most important figure in our story today. Born in 1831, Wilton worked at a variety of things on Chincoteague. He was the postmaster, the customs collector, the magistrate and merchant. The 1860 census lists him as a sailor. The 1870 census as a gentleman, whatever that means. Uh, John Wilton is probably the individual most responsible for making that very efficient move from farming to seafood uh, as the island's main uh, economy. 
And so by the time of the Civil War, Wilton Star shone bright enough that many on Chincoteague would say that Chincoteague is Wilton. Uh, it would only seem natural that he would lead this fight uh, for this island to stay in the Union. Before the secession vote, John Wilton had put up a giant U.S. flag on a 100-foot flagpole in front of his house on the island. Okay, this is car dealership flag time. The flag was big enough that it was visible from the mainland, okay? And so very shortly after the declaration of secession, when the flag didn't disappear, he had a visit. Uh, he had a visit from folks on the mainland telling him that he needed to take his flag down. And Wilton told them, apparently it had a, a bell with it as well, uh, he told them, I erected that flag and bell, and when they go down, I go down with them. But so long as I have a dram of powder and an ounce of lead and am able to use them, there they will stay. And there they stayed. <clears throat> now, Wilton's stance, we've, we've already hinted at this, may have been more about economics than anything else. What Wilton was also quoted as saying, while I was a strong southern man, my mind was made up that the south could not succeed. Beside all of our interests were in the north. We sold nearly all of our oysters that we raised in Philadelphia, and it would have meant starvation to us to have seceded and cut us off from that market. And again, if we look at the map, we can see that Chincoteague oysters can easily be taken up the coast and in the Delaware Bay and moved up to Philadelphia, and that's primarily what they were doing. So this was a, a, a pretty important thing for these folks. It was their entire living, and uh, Wilton wanted to hang on to that. So anyway, with Wilton at the helm, uh, the Tigers decided to ignore Virginia's secession declaration and attempt to remain in the Union, and it's not going to be that simple. There were some Confederate porters on, uh, supporters on Chincoteague, and there's not a lot of details of this, but they did try to form a company to subdue Wilton and uh, the island for the Confederacy. This led to a little-known engagement, naval engagement, and again, there are not really a lot of details of this other than that it happened, but Wilton and his supporters apparently met the Chincoteague Confederate sympathizers on the water in some flatboats. Uh, like I say, a few details of the engagement, but it seems like Wilton's Tigers were successful in driving off the Confederates across the Chincoteague Bay to the mainland and holding Chincoteague in the Union for the time being. But the fight wasn't over yet. The fact that Chincoteague had decided to stay with the Union and was taking steps to enforce that did not mean that they would be able to sell their oysters to the North. In fact, John Wilton himself would discover this particular issue on a trip to Philadelphia to acquire more goods for his shop on Chincoteague. Wilton was told that commerce between Philadelphia and Chincoteague was now illegal. Because of the established blockade, uh, which included Chincoteague, Wilton would not be able to take his goods back down to Chincoteague. The problem was, he had already paid for these goods when he found this out, and of course his boat was loaded. The boat was unloaded, and with no refund, uh, Wilton had to make his way back to the island. Uh, upon his return, he discovered that secessionists from the mainland had snuck over to neighboring Assateague Island, where there was a lighthouse, it was a coastal light on Assateague, still is, uh, and they had put the light out. So Wilton and some of his buddies went over to Assateague, and replaced the lighting apparatus and got it working again. After that, Wilton goes back to Philadelphia. He had set up a meeting with the mayor of Philadelphia in an attempt to get the merchandise he had paid for back. Uh, he told the mayor of Philadelphia that Chincoteague has voted to stay in the Union. We want to continue to be a part of the Union. Uh, and he got, from this meeting, he got permission to make a single trip to transport his goods, the goods he had paid for, back to the island. And the rest of this story reads like a Hemingway novel because Wilton has to sail back down the bay toward Chincoteague, but of course he's, he, at this point, he's trying to sail through commerce raiders or, 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 or commerce ships, what cutters, I guess is the word, uh, and he has to kind of sneak his way around. 
And it's uh, pretty interesting how he does that, the things that he has to do to more or less avoid them. And, and he kind of hugs the coast uh, in a way to keep those cutters from finding him as he gets back down to Chincoteague. So he makes it back. What to do next? Well, at this point, what they decide they need to do is inform the United States Navy of their situation. Uh, on July the 4th, 1861, now 418 men uh, from not just Chincoteague but other barrier islands of Virginia meet and they sign a pledge of loyalty to the Union. And this package is going to be delivered to the Navy in Hampton Roads along with a report, uh, along with a report of the situation on the eastern shore. They want to let folks know uh, what is going on because the Confederacy did start building up troops on the eastern shore. And they also ask for permission to continue selling oysters to the north. Uh, this pledge of loyalty that they sent was drafted by a Dr. George Shear. Uh, there were several letters from individuals uh, in this package, again describing the situation on the eastern shore. The highlight of this meeting, <laughs> I love this, the highlight of this meeting was apparently a War of 1812 veteran Captain Edward Whaley Sr., uh, a Shinkatig person, standing up and loudly declaring, I will defend the old flag to my last drop of blood against the lazy, slave-holding aristocrats and their lackeys in Richmond. But the pledge and the letters were packed onto a sloop called the Jenny Sharpley, which then sailed down the coast to Hampton Roads. Upon arriving in Hampton Roads on July 5th, the Jenny's crew found themselves in the presence of Flag Officer S.H. Stringham, who ignored the package completely, but apparently flew into a rage over how the islanders had slipped through his blockade and made it onto his ship unchallenged. May have been a fair question, actually. But Rear Admiral Silas Horton Stringham. He was born in Middleton, New York, November the 7th, 1798, served in the United States Navy from 1809 to 1861. You're going to find out why his service ended in 1861 very shortly. <laughs> uh, he was a veteran of the War of 1812, the Second Barbary War, the Mexican-American War, and briefly, the American Civil War. The thing is, uh, Stringham did absolutely nothing with this package, uh, with this pledge, these letters, this information, this intelligence, if you will, from the islands. Uh, what the islanders had to report uh, really makes this a shame, too. The letters said that there were Confederate forces building up on the eastern shore. They also reported that Confederates were shipping uh, weapons to their allies in Maryland and Delaware. Uh, they were being, these weapons were being shipped up the Chincoteague Bay as well as the Sinopuxent River. Uh, so in a variety of ways, they're just getting things up into Maryland and Delaware up this way. And so all of this was in that packet of information that the islanders sent to, uh, to Stringham. But he did absolutely nothing about it. Uh, and Confederate forces continued to build up in what was then Drummondtown County. It's now what is Accomack County. And for the most part, uh, if you think about the eastern shore being split in two, Accomack County is the northern part. And so that's, that's where the Confederates are actually building troops up there. Now, nothing else happens until September the 2nd at a cabinet meeting in Washington, D.C. Someone presents a letter to Abraham Lincoln uh, it's a letter from a commander, Edward Donaldson, that had been written to Admiral Stringham. I okay? uh, don't know who this fellow Donaldson is. Uh, like I say, we know who Stringham is. But Donaldson apparently had seen this packet of information, and he wrote this letter to uh, Stringham. Sir, I must bring to your immediate attention the plight of the loyal city citizens of the lower eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia. I was informed by my brother in a letter posted at Snow Hill that you were delivered intelligence which warned of the running of arms to rebels in that area. The Union cannot afford to lose the rice and bean crops from that area. The Eastern Shore was still agricultural, even though Chincoteague was making their living off the water. Uh, but the Union cannot afford to use the, lose the rice and bean crops from that area, nor can we afford to lose the inland routes between Lower Delaware and Chincoteague. If navigation is cut, 
on the Chincoteague and Cinepuxent Bays, uh, that's a problem. I mean in no way to sound disrespectful to you, sir. However, if that area is to be preserved, immediate protection for the loyal residents should be forthcoming and quickly. Edward Donaldson, Commander, U.S. Navy. Now this letter turned up at this September cabinet meeting. Upon hearing this letter, Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, apparently not amused, declared, if no action is pending, then Stringham will be replaced. And he was. Uh, Stringham was replaced on September the 19th, 1861. As you see, it happened pretty quick. This is a September 12 meeting. September 19th, 1861, Stringham is replaced with <coughs> this fellow here, Captain Lewis M. Goldsboro. Born on February the 18th, 1805 in Washington, D.C., he served in the United States Navy from 1812 to 1873, eventually reaching the rank of Rear Admiral. He served in the Aegean Campaign, the Mexican-American War, and the American Civil War, and he also would become superintendent uh, at Annapolis for a while. Uh, this is why Stringham's career ends in 1861. <laughs> also upon hearing this letter, General Winfield Scott, he is always a pleasant looking fellow, isn't he? I've, I've never seen a picture of him that doesn't look just like this one. <laughs> uh, but upon hearing the letter, <coughs> uh, General Scott declared that several thousand troops would be offered for the relief of Chincoteague and the Eastern Shore. Another result of this meeting was that President Lincoln personally authorized 14 captains that wrote these letters, 14 captains on Chincoteague to trade with northern ports. And now the stage was set for what would become known as the Battle of Cockle Creek. Okay. Still in September, September the 24th, 1861, eight small boats are spotted rowing across the Chincoteague Bay toward the island. Little boats out there, that's not that unusual. Okay. Whatever the boats were, uh, an alarm bell was sounded on the warehouse of the W.H. Watson Company on Chincoteague. Ninety-four Tigers were armed and responded to this bell, taking up positions along the waterfront by the warehouse and the docks. It turned out that what those boats were doing was marking a channel so that a few larger ships could get through the channel. And at dawn on the 25th, the larger ships arrived. The first was a schooner, not this one. <laughs> this is this is a uh, this is just an image so that you get an idea of what a schooner is. It's a two-masted uh, but small uh, uh, ship, and but it was the big ship that day. It was accompanied by two sloops. Here are sloops, single-masted ships. Again, a little bit smaller, uh, but they were moving into the Chincoteague Bay in the Cockle Creek area. I'll show you where that is in just a moment. Uh, Originally, uh, when it first showed up, the schooner was flying a British flag. But very quickly, it pulled that down and would run up a, a Confederate flag. Uh, so, at any rate, they anchored near Cockle Creek, which is here. Again, modern image, this is Chincoteague. Here we have uh, the entrance to Cockle Creek. And that's more or less where these ships are anchoring at this point in time. Once there, the Confederates <coughs> from the mainland began converting the schooner to a privateer. And what that means is, is that they put 10 cannon on this ship, and in her hold there were 1,000 New England rifles shot three tons of powder. Uh, at 135 feet, she had a broad beam and a shallow draft, and apparently this ship was perfect for preying on ships entering and leaving the Delaware Bay. Okay. And again, this is the intelligence that was in that packet of information that Stringham got and did nothing with. These ships were, uh, they, they knew that the Confederates were planning on creating a, a raider to get ships coming in and out of the Delaware Bay. Once converted, for all that it matters, the Confederates named this ship Venus. Okay. Now, again, the Tigers decided that the Navy needed to be made aware of what was going on. So once again, an oyster sloop called... Uh, an oyster sloop captained by Edward Whaley, Jr., and crewed by William Lynch, John Jester, Henry Savage, and Robert Sneed, headed to Hampton Roads. Whaley and his crew were taken to the USS Minnesota to see Captain Goldsboro, who fell in charge down there, remember? Uh, they got a far more cordial reception uh, from Goldsboro than the delegation that met Stringham. The meeting resulted in four Minnesota sailors being detailed to accompany the islanders back with a pledge of help. And then on September the 30th, <coughs> uh, 
the Iron Hull steamer USS Louisiana, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Alexander Murray, uh, arrived at Chincoteague uh, with 90 sailors. And here we have the USS Louisiana. It's over here. There's actually a picture of this thing, or an image, I guess I should say. It was a 295-ton screw gunboat built in Wilmington, Delaware in 1860. Uh, she was built as a commercial steamship, but the U.S. Navy bought her in July of 1861. Commissioned in August, she was employed in forcing the blockade. Uh, all the information says it was a two-stack ship, okay, although it's kind of hard to see from that image. It looks like just one to me, or maybe they were side by side, or maybe the other stack is here on the other side of this mast. But again, that's, that's the only image of this ship that exists. Uh, three mast could also be used as a sailing vessel, like many vessels in this day. She sported four guns, a 12-pounder, uh, two 32-pounders, and a smooth bore Dahlgren. Uh, Lieutenant Commander, there he is. Uh, Alexander Murray was the skipper, born on January the 2nd, 1816, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He served in the United States Navy from 1835 to 1878, retiring as a rear admiral. He was a veteran of the Mexican-American War and the United States Civil War. Now at 9 a.m., yep, Cockle Creek, at 9 a.m. Uh, on October the 5th, two boats launched from the Louisiana, and these boats held 23 men with orders to attack the Venus, seizing her or destroying her. Moving through the Chincoteague Channel, the Louisiana opened fire with a 32-pounder. So the, the Chincoteague Channel is down here, and all of this action is happening this direction toward the ships there at Cockle Creek. Uh, at any rate, uh, a Virginia force of about 300 that were there in that area, working on the ship, I suppose, uh, attempted to cut off the Louisiana's boats. Again, details are sparse, but this effort fails. The Louisiana crew successfully attack and board the Venus. Once there, they make a breastwork on board the Venus and begin op opening fire on the Virginia force. Uh, fire from the Louisiana eventually drives off that force, and the boarding crew sets fire to the Venus, uh, which burns to the waterline in Cockle Creek. It may still be there. There was never any real salvage done on the ship, although the uh, cannons and rifles were salvaged from the Venus. Uh, fortunately today, there's a pretty decent little after-action report on this engagement written by Lieutenant Commander Murray to Goldsboro. Murray writes, This morning at 9 o'clock, we had a sharp conflict with the enemy, who with 300 strong attempted to cut off two boats from this vessel and 23 men, all told, which I had dispatched to take or destroy a fine schooner, which I had reason to believe was being converted into a privateer. Fortunately, I had gone in with the steamer at the same time, it being high tide, and was enabled to cover the return of the party. The boats, after passing through a terrible fire, finally reached the schooner, but finding her aground, made a breastwork of her, and opened a deadly fire, which, with the assistance of a few shots from our long-range gun, drove the enemy back to a distant cover uh, with loss, and the boats, after firing the schooner, returned without further molestation. Acting Master Furness estimates the loss of the rebels at at least eight killed and wounded, as he saw that number carried off. Our loss was one seriously wounded, acting Master Hooker, and three very lightly. I have nothing but praises to bestow on those engaged in the boats for their coolness and intrepidity when assailed by such overwhelming odds. They were yet some 300 yards from the schooner when fired upon, but they preferred pushing on and returning through it rather than fail in accomplishing their object. During a reconnaissance last night, two of their dispatch sloops were captured. So the two sloops were captured as well in this action. Uh, they were taken to Norfolk as prizes. Upon hearing the news, General Scott is supposed to have made his way to the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C. and ordered Chincoteague oysters in their restaurant. The Louisiana remained at Chincoteague until late December. In fact, two days after the Battle of Cockle Creek, the Louisiana captured the schooner S.T. Carrison with a cargo of wood near Wallops Island. Wallops Island is, is just south of Chincoteague in this area. It's where we're launching rockets from uh, today. Um, Alfred Hopkins uh, 
yeah, the Chincoteague boats led by uh, Alfred Hopkins returned and also burned three Confederate vessels near Chincoteague Inlet. In January of 1862, the Louisiana was, burnt, was moved to Hatteras, North Carolina, a rather sad development for this ship. She was eventually filled with powder and turned into a floating bomb. Uh, on the night of December the 23rd, 24th of 1864, she was detonated in an attempt to damage Fort Fisher in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay, October the 15th, Commander Murray uh, issues an oath of allegiance to, uh, to the U.S. to all Chincoteague citizens. Well, not all, most anyway. Uh, there were some that were not available, but suffice it to say, nearly all the Teaguers swore allegiance to the Union. The Chincoteague watermen were then issued passes for their boats to supply oysters to the northern ports. Commander Murray then sent news to Hampton Roads of the successful events and sent along a petition written by John Wheelton, <coughs> our man, and uh, James Connor, which stated, among other things, that by interest and affection we cling to the Union. We are united as one man in our abhorrence to the secession heresy. The petition went on to state that the islanders would feel threatened with no protection from the federal forces. And this resulted, this is what resulted in the Louisiana staying in uh, at Chincoteague for a few more months, uh, patrolling the inlet and, and making the folks that were living there feel a little bit better. Now, General Scott actually sent his promised troops to the eastern shore. By December the 8th, there were 4,000 federal troops that had secured by the end of 1861, okay, 4,000 federal troops secured the eastern shore of Virginia for the Union. Now, the story of the Battle of Cockle Creek, uh, it's a little-known episode of the American Civil War. It's a cute story, at least as far as battles and war can be cute, uh, and it does involve some major players on the American Civil War landscape. Uh, but I think that there are a couple of things that we might be able to glean from this tale that uh, might be of, of some import to us. First of all, uh, not all Southerners supported the Confederacy. Those who lived on the Virginia coast and made their living uh, from selling seafood to northern cities uh, did so in large part without slaves. These, these were folks that were doing things mostly with their families. It's not to say that slavery didn't exist on the eastern shore. It did, and as in so many areas, there were a lot of divided opinions uh, over this. Uh, but the island watermen went to sea and harvested oysters, like I say, primarily with family as their labor force. So there was not necessarily the need and we'll talk about desire, but certainly the need to uh, preserve slavery to do this work. Um, another thing that I think is interesting is, to me, I wonder if this might be the end of what, for lack of a better term, I will call the states' rights era or the practicality of states' rights. And what I mean by that is a time when individual states could exist self-contained without interaction with other states. Was that coming to a close? Those Virginia watermen were selling their products across state lines, and so their state leaving the Union was a far greater threat to them than the possibility of the emancipation of slaves. And certainly a war which ended that or interrupted it was not desired. And I'm reminding, you know, you look at it, headlines, our more recent headlines, uh, after the last election there was this wave of different states talking about wanting to secede from the Union because they didn't care for the outcome of the election. And I remember one fellow from Mississippi saying that, because Mississippi was one of those states that people were, were saying it wanted to secede, and I remember one fellow writing saying that Mississippi gets more federal aid than any other state in the Union, and that apart from the Union they're simply a third world country. Uh, and so that's another thing that I think about as I think of this story. And we think about the Civil War as being a very complex story anyway. Uh, and here, here we start to see that complexity sneaking in. You know, the, the, those, those Southerners needed the North for their livelihood. Uh, and I think that that's a kind of an important thing. Interestingly enough, this did create an animosity between the Eastern Shore and Chincoteague Island that really exists to this day. And it's an interesting thing. I, I have friends on Chincoteague that contemplate why they're still a part of Virginia. 
You know, they, they, they think for some reason, you know, they think maybe we should be a part of Maryland. Maybe we should be a part of a northern state. But it, like I say, it's, it's, it's another one of those interesting complexities of this war. Uh, and then, of course, there was the patriotic aspect of this decision, the allegiance to and desire to maintain the Union. Captain Whaley's promise to defend the old flag to my last drop of blood shows a love of the Union that was felt by many Southerners, who in many cases were in areas so heavily populated by supporters of secession that they felt they simply could not voice that opinion. You can see this out in the Shenandoah Valley as well, a very similar uh, thing. So, uh, Chincoteague found itself struggling against the efforts of the secessionists on the mainland. And the really interesting thing is, that, as I said, it created this animosity. Uh, and a lot of this anger today maybe economic. You know, the last figure I heard was that Chincoteague is responsible for about 70 percent of the annual income of Virginia's eastern shore. Thank you, tourism. Okay. Uh, but a lot of that anger began in the 1860s when this one small part of Virginia decided to ignore its state's secession decision and remain with the Union. Um, I will wrap up this thing by telling everybody uh, you I'm a pretty regular, my wife and I are pretty regular visitors to Chincoteague. We travel over there every single year. Uh, it's, um, it's a second home for us. Uh, and it's a delightful spot to visit, okay? It really is. There's a lot of wildlife to see, uh, an ocean to enjoy. There are many places to explore. So if you get a chance, I would very definitely recommend going. I will tell you, if you do, take your bug spray. <laughs> because those guys are going to be there. So uh, there is the story of Chincoteague Island. Uh, there's not a whole lot more to know about the story than I have told you. But if you do have any questions, uh, I did bring this along. A lot of what I'm talking about today comes from the one and only history of Chincoteague I have ever found, <laughs> written by an Eastern Shore fellow named Kirk Mariner. and. Uh, Again, a nifty little story of, of the place. Is he so, a uh, He is not. <laughs> but he is an Eastern Shore native. And he, in fact, he's a fairly, uh, uh, fairly prolific writer. He's written a number of books that deal with Eastern Shore history in general. But like I say, only, only she could take a history book I've ever found. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>